Hmm. Hmm. Throughout my time here, Fukushima has become a story of similarities and differences with respect to other disasters like the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. I wasn't expecting it to be similar in its rates, especially ambiently, but it is. And I wasn't expecting to see the differences that I do. Case in point, we are getting the same kinds of high level rates that I found walking throughout Pripyat and other parts of the Chernobyl exclusion zone right here, right in front of a new home or two people that we saw earlier live, where they're ostensibly working with their garden, digging up through the dirt that we can see just a few feet from their home is grossly contaminated. Is this a place that you'd wanna be rehabitating? After multiple reactor meltdowns in 2011, over 160,000 people were evacuated from the cities and towns surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. More than 10 years later, even with the majority of evacuation orders lifted, almost no one has returned home. When I explored the Fukushima exclusion zone in the April of 2023, it was easy to see why, at least to the untrained eye. Ambient radiation rates much higher than anything I saw in Chernobyl were everywhere, even right out of your car. I freely admit that I was shocked at first given these rates, that a forever abandoned city like Pripyat seemed safer than towns in Japan having their evacuation orders lifted. How could this area become so quickly revitalized? How could anyone be asked to return home with a straight face? This wasn't the story I came to Japan expecting to tell, and the dissonance weighed heavily on me for the 10 days I was there. When I got home and tried to see the bigger picture in making this piece, however, I was challenged again. Were the rates I saw in Japan actually as scary as they looked? What does the science say? Did 160,000 people really need to pick up their lives and run? And if not, an even more shocking conclusion presents itself. Was the evacuation of Fukushima worth it? I think the answer to that question is no. On March 11th, 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant drowned. As the backup generators were now below the terrifying new sea level, they quickly failed ending any ability to continue cooling three of the nuclear cores on site. We've covered the intricacies of the meltdowns that followed, but not the public response. On the first day, an evacuation order was issued within a three kilometer radius of the plant. Later the same day, people within a 10 kilometer radius were ordered to stay indoors. The next day on March 12th, the evacuation zone was extended to 20 kilometers from the plant. This is what the evacuation orders looked like by that April. A strict evacuation zone, a planned evacuation zone, and a prepare to evacuate zone. In total, almost 3% of the Fukushima prefecture was affected by evacuation orders. By 2017, six years after the meltdowns, many evacuation orders had been lifted, the exceptions still being the so-called difficult to return zones, closest to the plant and directly under the radioactive plume it produced. In 2023, even more evacuation orders were lifted including small portions of the difficult to return zones. This is all undoubtedly progress, but today 30 to 40,000 people are still considered evacuees and almost none of them have returned or plan on returning home. Entering one of the abandoned houses here in Fukushima, it strikes me as a Japanese Pripyat. You see the indications of where people hastily brought whatever they could with them and left everything non-essential behind. You have in closets behind me, toys, food items, a calendar reads 2011 when the people evacuated. Unlike a Chernobyl-like disaster, there was also an earthquake and a tsunami. You see the results of that. You see beautiful old shrines shaken down to their foundations. You still see 
damage where the tsunami swept out everything in its path and it hasn't been rebuilt. You have three different disasters acting at the same time in this area. And the only thing that can really tell the difference between them is this. If there's a factor that connects all major nuclear disasters besides radiation, it's poor communication. Like Three Mile Island before it, Fukushima was a PR disaster on top of a nuclear one. The communication efforts of the Japanese government and plant operator TEPCO are now widely considered to be at the very least seriously lacking, and at most, potentially dangerous. Did the people of Fukushima have to stay or go? Shelter in place or evacuate? For how long could you eat the local food? How much radiation was too much? How could the public be sure of that? All of these questions were mishandled in one way or another, which in turn both increased the mental health burden among evacuees and extended evacuation timelines. Thousands of people picking up their lives when poor communication is all they have to go on will inevitably be chaos. And in Fukushima's case, the mass movement was based on the recommended radiation dose limits of less than, more than, and much more than 20 millisieverts per year, or 21 thousandths of a sievert, a unit that links radiation to the biological effects of ionization. According to the International Commission on Radiological Protection, the acceptable dose rate for members of the public in an emergency situation is between 20 and 100 millisieverts per year. Outside of a disaster's immediate aftermath, 1 to 20 millisieverts a year is acceptable the latter being the equivalent of a single CT scan. This map was created just weeks after the meltdowns. How many areas have rates higher than the 100 millisievert per year limit? None. How many areas have rates higher than the 20 millisievert limit for the long term? Just the areas closest to the plant and directly under the plume. And that was 10 years ago. The rates are much lower now. Given the directly detectable radiation rates alone, did it make sense, from a health physics perspective, to order the evacuation of everyone within a 30-kilometer radius of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant? No, it did not. According to a Japanese assessment of the risks and benefits of the evacuation in 2022, quote, From the results of the environmental dose rate measurement of the TEPCO accident, it seems that the area exceeding 100 millisieverts per year in the first year of the accident is not so large, even though three reactors melted. There is no need to evacuate the entire circular area around 30 kilometers from the nuclear power plant. End quote. It sounds unbelievable at first, but because of the relatively low radiation rates in most places, there is a world where a large-scale evacuation of Fukushima could do more harm than good. A world where more damage could be done to people's lives if they had to unexpectedly leave them than radiation could ever do. A world where the evacuation itself actually killed more people than anything bubbling out of liquid uranium. Unfortunately, it seems like this is the world we live in. The estimated number of radiation-induced cancers after the Three Mile Island incident is statistically Less than one. Zero. Not a single plant worker died during the Fukushima disaster. Neither have there been any confirmed long-term health effects from the three melted cores. 31 plant personnel perished in the immediate aftermath of Chernobyl, both from the explosions and acute radiation poisoning. But after that, like Fukushima, there have been no confirmed long-term health effects from the radiation released in Ukraine or over Europe. It's quite likely according to the decades of studies that have now been done, that more people die every hour in accidents somewhere on the world's roads than have died as a direct result of meltdown-generated radiation ever. What we know the people in these disasters did endure, however, was an evacuation-enabled assault on their mental health. After Three Mile Island, depression, anxiety, PTSD, Conditions that are associated with early mortality, disability, and an overutilization of medical services. After Chernobyl, a similar picture. Depression, social isolation, and increase in suicide rates among the evacuated. And after Fukushima, depression, PTSD, and increase in suicide rates. <laughs>
The consensus today appears to be that the only significant health effects after these disasters have been very real and very damaging mental health outcomes. And in Japan, the evacuation made things even worse. It is now estimated that over 2,300 people, mostly elderly and or hospitalized, died as an indirect result of the long-term evacuation of the Fukushima prefecture. This disastrous side effect was so great in Japan, in fact, that, quote, the long-term evacuation of the TEPCO accident is not justified by the risks and benefits. It has done more harm than good, end quote. I argue here, as others have, that the socio-political response to the two most impactful meltdowns in history have caused far more damage than the meltdowns themselves and the low-level radiation they produced ever could. This possibly shocking statement deserves a counterfactual. If the radioactive contamination from any meltdown was substantially higher, like the lethal rates inside of a reactor core, then long-term evacuation would obviously do more good than harm, save communities, save lives. But in Japan, we know now that the total radiation dose avoided by evacuating wasn't even at the lowest possible health effects value in 11 out of 13 municipalities. 100 millisieverts is the lowest number linked to health effects like cancer. And these rates were measured the same year as the meltdowns. The dose avoided each year afterwards would be less and less. There was no need to evacuate so much of Fukushima, but over 160,000 people fled anyway. Drastic actions in the face of arguably manageable radiation rates come from the widespread adoption of the so-called linear no-threshold model by many world governments and agencies, which is the theory that any dose of radiation will have health effects. This is contrasted by the more scientifically validated threshold model that holds 100 millisieverts per year as a threshold beyond which health effects start to be detectable. The end result of regulating all radiation down to as close to zero as possible as many governments following this model do is that many evacuation protocols tend to extend evacuation times and areas when they don't have to. The World Nuclear Association agrees. Quote, Many evacuated people in Japan remain unable to fully return home due to government-mandated restrictions based on conservative radiation exposure criteria. End quote. We know now that the real pain and suffering in Japan is not from radiation sickness. It's from homesickness. The complicated conclusion is that a larger than normal yearly dose of radiation can actually be better for a person than an extended evacuation, given the social and mental health disaster it may precipitate. The equivalent of an extra CT scan each year is better than loss of income, loss of community, and an indirect loss of life. The Fukushima prefectural government has said that the number of indirect deaths from evacuation in the prefecture is now greater than the number of people who died during the tsunami. It is plausible that at least a hundred times more people have died as a result of unnecessary evacuations in Japan and Ukraine than have died from any meltdown-related radiation ever. This doesn't fit with how the public imagines these disasters, and that is why communication here is so important. Knowledge informs public policy and opinion and could change the response to another nuclear disaster if it happens. The good news is that there are easy solutions. 
We could change the radiation rates that create evacuation zones in the first place, bring them more in line with rates that we know cause health effects. We could prioritize the care of the elderly and hospitalize if they must be moved, and let them return to their homes sooner than younger people, as an increased risk of cancer in 20 years isn't the same risk for someone who is already 70. And we could adopt the more scientifically validated threshold model to shorten evacuation timelines, especially when long-term evacuation would literally destroy communities, as it has in Japan. These relatively simple steps and the proper communication of risk to the public would make a tremendous difference. In Greece and Italy in 1987, the year after Chernobyl exploded, birth rates fell dramatically. But it wasn't because of radiation itself. Because of a false perception of Chernobyl, frightened and uninformed mothers were dropping birth rates across Western Europe because they were ending their pregnancies in elective abortion. It has now been estimated that the total number of pregnancies, poor, lacking, and or false communication efforts indirectly ended this way was 1 to 200,000. More harm than good. Until next time.